Next up, we have our keynote. Um, walk slowly, Sunil, because I have a couple of things to say. Okay, cool. I'm like, don't come up yet. Um, so hey again, I hope you all are enjoying yourselves and enjoying what we've been hearing. Thanks again to everyone who has come before. Uh, I'm back to introduce our dynamic and multifaceted keynote speaker. And of course, he is going to take us all on a journey shortly, but I do wanna take a moment to share a couple of things before he takes the stage. And so he is Sunil Radia, and he is the wearer of many industry hats. I'd say that the most relevant one is that he is one of your fellow MAPE alums from the class of 99, that's right. And naturally, in the 20 years since finishing the MATE program, Sunil has been enjoying an amazing and ever unfolding and revealing career. So Sunil is a self-proclaimed marketing misfit, innovation nerd, and optimist. He's obsessed with brands and technology. And in his agency days, Sunil wore multiple hats. He was a creative director, a strategy director, and a media director, and he won awards across, won awards across each of those categories. Today, he's CEO and Chief Innovation Officer at Proto. And if you don't know, Proto is an innovation and design consultancy that's focused on bringing different disciplines together to uncover practical solutions and outputs. Sunil is passionate about not only how to make our industry better by innovating, but he's also passionate about giving back. And so it's no surprise that he's on the board of the 4As Foundation, and I'm very fortunate that I get to work with him in that capacity. He's also on the board of an organization I was unaware of, but it's called Plus Pool. And I think it's really cool, so I'm gonna talk about it for a second. So it's a nonprofit that he supported since it was a Kickstarter campaign a couple years ago. Designed here in New York, it's the world's first water filtering floating Pool. So it filters river water that it floats in and makes it possible for New Yorkers and others who are in the area to swim in clean river water for the first time in 100 years. So this is just, to me, further proof of Sunil's commitment to giving back and his deep belief that innovation is and does, um, or that innovation can, I should say, and does truly make things better for all of us. And a final fun personal fact, and you probably know what I'm gonna say, but Sunil's daughter and my daughter go to the same Brooklyn Public School, and they've been friends since first grade, and they're so cute. But his family just welcomed a brand new baby, and so it's extra special, and we are super grateful that you took time out on a Sunday to be with us, your other family, the MAPE family. And so please help me welcome to the stage our keynote speaker and your fellow MAPE alum, Sunil Ray. Thank you, Tangi. I might make Tangi my uh, hype woman everywhere I go, because that was amazing. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do something that's a first for me, which is I'm going to read off of paper. I've never actually even read a speech before, much less one off of paper. So this will be a good learning experience for all of us together. Um, so forgive me. So um, given the, the, for those virtually you can't see, there's thousands of people here, uh, and many of them are, are still early in their careers. Uh, so I thought what I would talk about today is talent development, because, hey, that's what we're here for. Um, specifically, multidisciplinary talent and what you should look for in your leaders in your work environment. I'll start briefly about my own career uh, and the leaders that enabled it, and then I'll shift to some principles and philosophies I'm now applying that I hope you all find useful. If that sounds super boring, please blame Tangi. Um, so when I first finished undergrad, I actually took a job at Starcom. Uh, it's actually the same organization that I did my uh, MAPE internship with a year prior. It was a life-changing experience for me. It was a big deal. I grew up in San Antonio, Texas, and suddenly I was living in Chicago, and I was walking to work amongst all these tall buildings and buzzing energy. And I remember thinking as I walked into this iconic Leo Burnett building every day, Wow, I'm an adult. That was a real thought I had, which is funny now, 20 years later. Uh, thank you for doing the math for me, Tanji. Uh, and I wake up today and I'm like, ugh, I'm an adult. But I did learn a lot about the media business at Starcom. Um, I confirmed most of what I learned in school was already outdated. Uh, and I say that with love for my alma mater. Uh, but the reality is any industry that's being transformed, it's difficult to teach in school. 
Um, most industries are changing faster than any academic institution could possibly keep up with. And it's why programs like MAPE are so important. Not only do they give uh, developing talent hands-on experience in a way that can teach them more than school ever could alone, but they also actually let that, let that talent uh, be a flow of diverse employees that hopefully help these transforming industries become inclusive systems. When I took my full-time offer, um, I actually worked in our group called Starcom IP. Starcom IP is, was, at that time, like the argue, arguably the leading digital media agency. And I was focusing on this exciting new medium. Uh, and it was all about trying to figure out how this web would offer brands new opportunities with their consumers. Um, I got to be a part of this innovative part of a big stable company. So kind of the best of both worlds. I got to do new things, but I felt like I was in like a safe corporate environment, and that was nice. Uh, this pioneering new unit needed new talent and fresh thinking, and honestly, I loved that because it meant my lack of experience was kind of an advantage, actually. Um, I was obviously going to bring new perspective because I had no perspective. So even as early as 21 years old, I got to help create standards for web advertising. And for that, I'm sorry because holy cow, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, and apparently, few others did either because amazingly, some of those standards are still used today in an industry that is clearly broken. Um, so maybe people having no idea what they're doing is not like the best idea ever, but it is a learning experience that's paying dividends even now, years later. Uh, and it spurred an era of modernizing what brands ask for from their advertising and sponsorship dollars. Um, because those brands are directly connected with their consumers, who, in mass, are hugely powerful, changing how companies behave. That felt like a big lesson for me then, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Much of the work I do today includes helping companies distill their purpose in a way that guides their future and ensures that their employees get to serve some type of higher purpose. I wouldn't have the tools to do that, credibly, if I didn't get to spend at least part of my career seeing how much consumers can influence what companies do and how any company behaves, even if I didn't know that's what I was learning back then. It's hard to see wisdom driving by until it shows up in the rearview mirror, and I think that's an important part of career development that gets undervalued sometimes. From that start in digital media to now doing innovation work, I've had kind of an odd journey especially when you realize along the way I worked in video games, social media, product incubation, uh, a lot of different cities in the middle too. But as a multidisciplinary person, it took having the right leaders, creating the right environment for that journey to work out for me. They allowed that experience to actually unlock wisdom that I could then apply elsewhere. And that's what I want to dive into with you all today. But before I do, I should start at the beginning. And like many a story from a young man, at a certain age, it involves a girl. So a year out of school, I was working at Starcom IP, and I started dating a girl long distance. Uh, and a year after that, we decided to give it a real go and move to LA together, a city where both of us knew absolutely no one because we thought that would make it fair. And I might add, where Starcom IP did not have an office. So after two years at a job I loved, I resigned. When I told my manager, she, I remember this, goes, uh, hold on. Okay. And then her boss, who I knew pretty well, called me into his office. I went to his office, and he goes, hold on. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure what else to do. So I went back to my desk, uh, and I hopped on AOL Instant Messenger. You can ask your parents about that. Uh, to chat with the girl. She asked how resigning went. I said, look, I'm not sure. Uh, everyone just kind of said, hold on. Is that normal? Neither of us had any idea. I wasn't sure if that meant I had resigned or what was going on. Um, then later that afternoon, this man came by. Now, some of you may already be, I love that there's a slight round of applause for Rashad, and honestly, if anyone deserves it, it's him. Uh, it sounds like some of you are already familiar with Rashad, but if you aren't, I'd recommend looking him up. He's kind of the godfather of innovation in the marketing industry. Um, at that time, he was the CEO of Starcom IP. Now, Rashad's a super approachable leader, and uh, anyone can kind of go up and talk to him. But I was a little bit surprised to see, you know, at that time, my bosses, 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 boss come by and ask me to have a coffee. Um, so I obliged, and we went down to the Starbucks in the lobby of that iconic building I showed you. And Rashad sat with me. He asked me about this girl. 
He asked me what my family thought of her, about my life's ambitions. And the entire time, he never brought up how stupid my plan was to quit in the middle of the dot-com crash, move to a city I don't know a single human being, and think, I'm going to go and get a job there somehow without any connections or friends. Um, and he made me, and instead, he actually uh, encouraged me. He said, look, I understand why you want to move to LA, and I want to make you a deal. I will set up any interview you want while you're there as long as I get to be the last interview that you take. No brainer, right? You take that deal all day long. So I end up going to LA. I have six interviews. And honestly, interviews may not even be the most accurate word for them. I'll give you, I'll give you a sense of one of them. So uh, I'm there. I meet the chairman of one of these agencies. He never sat down once during our meeting. He greeted me, talked about how much Rashad's recommendation meant to him. Uh, and then he turned to his assistant and said, who was standing outside, and said, Shirley, can you get, um, what's your name? Um, I'm Sunil. Can you get Sunil here at a desk? He does media. And I was like, oh, no, I don't actually work here yet. I'm still interviewed. But he was gone. He had left the office. He, and so I have to kind of awkwardly tell Shirley, look, I, I don't really work here yet, but I'll follow up with next steps, I guess. Um, so I come back to Chicago. And I'm ecstatic. I think I have multiple job offers in hand. I mean, that's about as productive a kind of interview trip as you can take. And uh, I, I explained to him, uh, I explained to Rashad, look, I'm so grateful for everything you did. And I want to you know, kind of go out of my way to tell you my thinking on my job offers. And he interrupts me. And he says, hey, we had a deal. I said, no, I understand. He said, I'm going to be your last interview. I said, absolutely. So uh, he said, here's your interview. I said, I'm ready. And he said, write down a job description. Keep it to a page, write down a salary you think is fair for that job description, and assume it's approved. And you can do it from your apartment in LA. I ended up working for Rashad for 13 years after that in a wide range of roles, a lot of different companies. And tell me that isn't a story about a pioneering leader. Yeah. And y'all get, I mean, me, because I was working remotely in my pajamas, right? Like way before y'all. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but seriously, this was one of my most profound lessons, uh, both in terms of fellowship and in terms of leadership. As an employee, I realized I prospered most under empathetic leaders. It created loyalty in me, and I felt like they were loyal back. And as a future leader, I knew that I had to lead with trust. I had to empower employees to get the best out of them. When those two things come together, empathy in leadership and this trust in fellowship, it creates a cycle. You start generating new leaders for the future and ensuring your current leaders know when to actually follow their employees. Knowing that was my ambition, I found my way to work across different cities and in different roles for a number of iconic people in our industry, including Emma Cookson, Bob Greenberg, and Michael Conrad. Each, each one taught me something different about the role of leadership and followership in their own way. And each one actively valued me for being multidisciplinary. They didn't see someone particularly inconvenient who couldn't fit into these predetermined boxes. Michael, as head of the Berlin School, really pushed me on my thesis about media design, which was this idea of treating media as a canvas for your ideas instead of a container to put your ideas in. Then he actually hired me, even though I was just an MBA student, to test that thesis with a client. He went out of his way to go and get me placed somewhere to go and actually apply this stuff. And then I often heard him publicly advocate to agencies about my thesis, media design, and how they should rethink the way they creative and media talent come together. Then at BBH, Emma let me work as a strategist back then on Google Chrome and then to write, let's say, a creative brief because we're doing advertising work. And then I got to take that creative brief as a creative and work on the actual ideas themselves. And I realized that was someone, even though the system was the same, she had enabled me to do what my skills were, not necessarily what my job description was. And that really stuck with me. Then lastly, at RGA, Bob understood that to compete in the consulting world, these clients valued something very different than RGA had ever made historically. So we would have to operate outside the system to do these new things. And then he went and he made that space for me there. So when I founded Proto 15 months ago, uh, it's probably no coincidence that myself and my co-founders hard-coded many of these human-centric beliefs into our company. And we made sure that any investor we took money from was aligned with those values. This was critically important to me. 
especially if I was going to have a company with these empathetic leaders, and they are that, because our decisions wouldn't be based solely on profit. In fact, the whole point was we should have lots of different perspectives, and they may vary. Um, and clearly, a lot of perspectives at the top of this company when you have seven co-founders. Um, when we were raising money to launch, though, uh, an interesting thing happened. I had the following conversation on more than one occasion. Basically, we'd have our investor pitch, so to speak, and uh, the main investor would basically say, okay, why doesn't everyone else drop, and Sunil and I will, will talk afterwards. And they always gave me same ver some version of the following speech, and it was basically, you have too many founders. You, it's too messy. There's no way to run a company with that many different perspectives. You should plan for the worst case scenario amongst all of you. Trust nobody else. And I just remember thinking, well, obviously, I need an investor that understands that seven founders is a feature, not a bug. And so how do I actually make sure that whatever our company is doing is enabled by money that actually believes in the value of these different perspectives? Because for us, the people involved are the business. The people are the point. That's why we're doing this. And that's why people are front and center in Proto's purpose. Advance people via the scale of meaningful organizations. As you heard, we're a consultancy and design studio that does innovation work on behalf of clients. We try to choose purpose-led organizations to work for, knowing the biggest impact we can make includes their people and all their customers too. That's how we can make our dent in the universe, advancing people via our clients and our partners. We're currently in the midst, in the midst of a two-year process of becoming a B Corp, which is a business that meets the highest standards of verified social and environmental performance, transparency, and legal accountability to balance profit and purpose. And it gives me a lot of optimism that credentials like that matter to new generations of talent like yourselves. And I know that this is the best way to keep up companies honest. As you guys heard, one of my earliest lessons was companies behave the way large groups of people come together and make them behave. The most important thing to understand about Proto, though, is that we know practical innovation, as you heard, thank you, Tangi, requires being multidisciplinary. Innovation is hard. Really, if there's like one summary of like what I've learned over these last 20 years, it's, it's the single slide. That's actually the title of my book, I think. Whether you're launching a new brand, a new business, model, new product or service, or you're just rethinking what's already there, there are going to be many variables involved. And today, most clients have to work with lots of type of companies and partners to pull that off. Sure, a few very big clients have in-house innovation offerings that can help them do some of those steps internally. But even these companies often end up being the spenders, the biggest spenders with outside partners so they can get outside perspective. Regardless, for most clients, this is a journey with a lot of handoffs and a lot of players in it. First, they need strategy consultants to help establish what problem is being solved and ensuring there's a clear corporate strategy that gets, that gets them there. These are often top-down views of the business, and boards love hearing an outside party has validated this thinking. Then they need an implementation consultant, which is often one of the, quote, big four consultants. Those are the companies that help actually get those big round numbers and strategy pillars into a plan that moves things forward. But what are you going to move forward exactly? Well, you got to design it, probably talk to some customers and do some research along the way to figure out what this new thing actually is. And then what about the name, the logo, the tone of voice, all that stuff? Well, that's where the brand studios come in. And then after that, well, you actually have to go to market. And going to market often requires an ad agency helping you figure out your media, your messaging, and all those things about how you actually introduce this to the world. That's a lot of players. Guess what usually happens when this collection uh, of companies is working together, uh, not even together, but all having to find a way through a client to get something out the door? Well, each firm will explain how the other screwed something up or didn't think things through down or upstream. So they'll need more money and time to fix those problems. And that's the thing. Each of, the, each of these companies is specialized. Like, these are good companies. They're right. One of the other companies probably didn't appropriately account for what they do. None of them can see the whole picture from the client's perspective. They can't empathize with a company that's learning firsthand how hard innovation is through having so many different points of view and so many different handoffs. Kaplan's Law of the Instrument states that when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. In short, you have a cognitive bias toward your most familiar tool. And this is exactly what makes innovation so hard for companies. I'd argue that it's the underlying driver of innovator's dilemma, 
as Deb, who works at Proto, will tell you, uh, I recommend everyone read Innovator's Dilemma because few business books age this well. Innovator's Dilemma states that incumbent companies often fail to apply disruptive technologies correctly because they try to frame them in their current business. Even when they're the first to get into the disruptive technology in the first place, they misuse it because they keep trying to get it to fit their current worldview versus understand it actually disrupted every single thing that they do. Do you know who invented the digital camera? Kodak. Who finished last in the digitization race? Kodak. That's Innovator's Dilemma. The story's common. Look at how railroads responded to automobiles, how newspapers responded to Google, hotels with Airbnb. No one was threatened by the disruptor that eventually kind of destroyed their business. They, and it wasn't because these companies were ignorant of the tech involved. In fact, you can tell because most of them ended up having to consolidate to deal with this thing that changed the game. And if you look, if you really think about it, in many ways, that's just the story of hammers all looking at something that wasn't a nail and trying to figure out, no, 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 this is just a new type of nail. How do we deal with it? It was an existential issue. So today, imagine you're a traditional bank. You're dealing with all these disruptive financial services. You go out, you hire a management consultant. They use the same frameworks to get to the same recommendation they did for every other bank. I'm not sure where your competitive advantage is in that. It certainly didn't come from the consultant. They make money by being expert in an industry. So that means you're a hammer if you're this bank and you just hired another hammer. But your problem may not be a nail, so why would you pay millions for a hammer? What if your problem is a screw? Or much more likely, what if we're talking about something truly disruptive and it's both or it's some other things too and you need lots of different tools? But in my opinion, the answer actually isn't by combining a bunch of different tools together. This sounds counterintuitive, I know. In fact, Combining lots of specialized tools together is how most companies or industry actually try to stay useful to clients. Publicis by Sapient, Accenture by Droga5, and Fjord, and well, that Accenture acquisition list is so long that I actually can't name enough tools to uh, list them all. And I won't bore you with it. And honestly, the reason I don't know those tool names, because that girl I told you about, she's my wife now, and she does all the handiwork in our house for the last 20 years. So buying more and more tools and expecting clients to pay for them all, including the ones you don't need, is absurd. That's throwing money at a people problem. My theory is that many more people love being hybrids than are given the opportunity to, and that actually these people are disproportionately valuable to companies. But companies don't know how to empower them. These people want to be a multi-tool in a world where companies value just a hammer. Look, no one can do everything but lots of people can do more than one thing. And the more unrelated they seem on the surface, actually, in innovation work, the more useful it is. And I want to pause here for a second and explain what I mean by being a multi-tool. I don't mean a generalist. I mean someone who's T-shaped. It's this combination of cross-discipline and depth of discipline. I meet so many young people who tell me, hey, I'm a hybrid like you, but they actually haven't spent enough time developing the depth of a single expertise in any one particular thing. I was a media director before I was a creative director, before I was a strategy director. Each of those was my full-time job. I wasn't doing a little bit of each at any given time. And for most people, that's not possible because they don't work at a company run by Bob or Emma or Michael or Rashad. But this T does not stand for tourist. When we write a scope for an innovation project at Proto, we have to know the title of your job is covered. If you're a commercial strategist creating a financial model, you're wholly accountable for that. If you also happen to be a designer that can impact, let's say, the visual identity of the thing you're working on, your voice will be heard and represented across those disciplines too. It's actually what makes both disciplines better, and the work more creative, more practical, and more innovative. And that's what clients want, practical help as they do this very hard innovation thing. You'll find the biggest difference between being a client's partner and being their vendor is whether or not they think you're broadly practical and useful or just useful in a single moment in time. In fact, I would argue clients want a tool belt full of different multi-tools. And amazingly, as easy as it sounds, that's what so much talent I've met wants too, to get to work across disciplines to ensure that their work actually has an impact. So you can see why I'm a big believer that multidisciplinary talent is the future. Honestly, scratch that, is the present. But how can one company be good at all those things? 
How can one company speak so many different languages and share values that at times can seem completely at odds with each other? Well, as scary as that sounds, that's exactly the ambition of Proto. Every company you see in this landscape uh, mostly hires from their direct competitors. And this whole list, it's actually just a partial list of where Proto employees, or Protobots as we affectionately call each other, worked at before coming to Proto. That's a cognitively diverse team. When you take a view at the whole landscape and every flavor, it seems like a great place to start for building that multi-tool tool belt. But how do you help all those people do the best work of their lives and live that purpose to help them actually put that dent in the universe we're talking about? Well, you have to find a way to figure out what connects Regina, who's in this room and came from KPMG, to Perry, who came from McKinsey, to Daniel, who came from Frog, to Kate, who came from Wolf Olins, to Shu, who came from Character, to Aaron, who came from Stink, to Matt, who came from Havas. And how do you do that? Well, you create shared philosophies amongst them. And you do that before you start to actually ask them to buy into processes, models, rules, reporting. Just get the shared philosophies down first. Do we agree on this? Because everything else, we can evolve over time together. Now, I'll be honest, as a result of having to evolve it over time, this is still very much a work in progress at Proto. And I know as a keynote speaker, you're not allowed to admit that we're still figuring some shit out. But hey, MAPE's a safe space. Yay. And <laughs> that's right, it is a safe space. And I will admit, we are very much a work in progress. Still, I want to share some of the philosophies that we're trying at Proto because we built a company of multidisciplinary people, and then we asked them to help us figure out what the best system is to support each other, and we're co-designing it together. The slides you're about to see are directly from our employee playbook, which is a living document. It evolves based on people's feedback, uh, and uh, I think it's incredibly smart because I'm not the only author of it. First and foremost, one of our shared values is that we value new practices over best practices. And honestly, holy shit, I'm over best practices. If you, I, I imagine most of you probably are too. Most companies, especially those with limited creativity, look at what a successful company did, and they consider it a playbook for the future. That almost sounds smart when you think about it, right? Clients love to reduce risk, so why not do that thing that already got done? But honestly, I think that's wrong. Companies each have different advantages, and most importantly, they have different people and cultures. What's right for one company, in my experience, is rarely right for another company. At least not in a way that lets them win, that resonates with their people, and that benefits from their culture. In fact, the first rule of innovation is building on your strengths. And best practices, by definition, don't do that. In fact, they undermine one of the most important variables that probably got a client to want innovation work in the first place. The world is constantly changing. And you can't frame the problem using a historical lens. You can't assume it's a nail, so to speak. If it's changing, why would something old enough where the results are in, they're tallied up, and a beautiful case study has been made, be a good starting point to build for a future you know will be different? And if you're seeking a competitive advantage, well, then it actually just kind of seems like that's Kaplan's Law of the Instrument again, but this time disguised as a playbook. Obviously, this requires giving people the freedom to fail. We can't just ask that our teams try something new and then get mad when it doesn't work. I'll be honest, on a bad day at Proto, we reinvent the wheel a lot. But on a good day, we create completely new pioneering approaches designed by groups of multidisciplinary people that came at a problem completely differently. We recently helped a 100-year-old academic, let's call them an academics recognition company, rethink their purpose. They wanted to know, what's the higher value they bring to the world? And how can that be used as a lens to determine their business priorities? They know the industry they're currently in is dying just to be totally honest about it. So as part of this exercise, we used value stream mapping. Before you tune out, just think about it this way. You have a, a project that sounds like it's about brand purpose, and we actually used what's considered a lean corporate uh, management tool to inform its broader brand purpose. And this only worked because Alex, who comes from a brand strategy background, worked with Stalin, who, works, who comes from a corporate strategy and incubator background, to go and design this completely net new process and output. And it changed the way that we think about what makes a purpose to a company practical. It helped them decide what new business they're in while still meaning something more than the actual profit part of what they do. That to me is unlocking, that is the definition of new practices over best practices. Next up is that ambiguity is a comfort zone. Look, no one loves ambiguity, but hey, if it makes you miserable, innovation is definitely not the industry for you because it is the black matter that makes up most of our universe. 
So we have to build a company that can thrive in it. We wouldn't be here if clients already knew the answer. And that's it. Is the problem a nail? Is it a screw? Is it a carriage bolt? I had to Google that last one, by the way. To do what we do, we actively plan for and embrace the unknown. That's hard. Most companies scale by creating processes and then fine tune them over time. We did an analysis last year of all of our work, and 100% uh, of our projects in 2021 had a pivot. Yes, every single project ended in a starting place that neither the client nor ourselves assumed when we scoped it. So Christina, who oversees our engagement practice, is a protobot whose superpower is calmness under pressure. We couldn't possibly do what we do without a client engagement team that's empowered in times of ambiguity and without talent that understands they'll have to move forward with imperfect or no information. That takes trust. And that trust begins with T-shaped people who not only know how to do their own job well, but who have enough expertise about other people's job to cut them some slack and help them rethink things as new information comes to light. That, help, that helps makes, makes others comfortable in ambiguity and it empowers them to help themselves. And as you'll hear us tell clients regularly, we reserve the right to get smarter. So of course we can change our mind as we learn more. Another philosophy is feedback is a gift. We say this so often it's almost become a joke, but we're dead serious about it. Giving each other feedback is hard, especially constructive feedback. It takes compassion to tell something, something they don't want to hear. I give that gift regularly. Honestly, at work, I'm fucking Santa Claus, and it still stresses me out having to give feedback that people don't want to hear. But if it's a culture of trust, because everyone knows that we're trying to make each other better and do this new thing that we haven't done before, then feedback is welcome. And what's been interesting for me to see as a CEO is that most of the feedback that's valued at Proto comes from the other disciplines. So if you're an experienced designer and you're hearing a brand strategist you know, provide feedback about how you've applied the strategy, or you hear a technologist talk about how the implementation will pose challenges based on what you've done, you actually value that because you know those people are increasing the odds of your work actually coming out and making a difference. They have a different perspective that you've on day one welcomed versus try to go and hide in a specialized environment to avoid. Each one owns a critical step in the process. If you were to work in one of those specialized companies, those voices are easy to ignore because they're so different from yours or they're so far removed. Honestly, some of them probably don't even work in the same company. In my mind, this is the reason that innovation fails so often. The industry is fragmented, so the feedback loop never gets closed to help each other. And then you can't get smarter at what you do. Proto's trying to close that loop through the gift of feedback. When Proto was a few months old, I got some feedback from Tommy, who's an associate director of experience on our team. It led to the creation of an entirely new set of benefits for our first 50 employees. We call this program the First 50 Program and ensure that there's a reward for those first 50 employees who took the leap of coming to a startup with risk like ours. Mm -hmm. I consider that one of the most generous gifts of feedback I've gotten, even though on our bottom line, it looks like one of the most expensive things that happened to us. Next up is everyone is a teacher. I'll be honest, working at Proto is pretty hard. It's challenging because no matter what type of background you come from, no one speaks your native language. There is no legacy mother tongue. Instead, as designers and strategists, developers, researchers, they all work together. They actually have to find a way to communicate in a way that lets them collaborate. So a lot of that jargon that you learned made you special actually is kind of a challenge to help you work with some of these other people. So in some sense, everyone is on foreign land at Proto. But the people who showed up are the T-shaped ones who most want to learn the disciplines, other disciplines, while improving their own craft, like we talked about. That's hard work, and of course, everyone comes ready to learn. I genuinely have never met a group with more of a growth mindset than this collection of people. But there can be no students without teachers, so we ask everyone to teach, and not just about their core expertise, but about anything and everything. We do weekly office hours where people just come together to talk about each other's work, and most companies, people try to minimize how much outside feedback they get on their work. Uh, and here I watch people show up and hear someone who does something different for a living tell them, this is what I think of what you've just put together. So regardless of your level or background, we ask that you teach us something. Help make everyone a better multi-tool, so to speak. So just a few weeks ago, Neela, who is now starting as an associate strategist at Proto, but back then was a win uh, winter associate, an apprentice at Proto, gave a presentation on bias in AI. And honestly, the first thing we did afterwards was have a meeting about how we need to change the way we make those types of recommendations to our clients. That's from our intern. Another core philosophy is that opportunity is a development tool. This is a nice way of saying that at some point in your first 100 days of Proto, you will think, 
why am I in charge of this? Does anyone else realize that I have no idea what I'm doing right now? And honestly, the answer is, yeah, we do know that. We're huge believers that the best way to raise your own ceiling is to make you find it on your own. Or put another way, to become an expert swimmer of any stroke, what better way to learn it than to be thrown in the deep end? We'll ensure others are keeping an eye out so you don't drown. But honestly, they really won't jump in unless it's a proper emergency. This is daunting, but we found that it leads to huge professional leaps. And it means that if and when the time comes that you decide to leave Proto, you'll have real hands-on experience that most other companies had to give you a training program to try to get you to do. We recently did a project helping Samsung with DE&I design. And the core team doing the work were not only all new to Proto, but the highest title involved was associate director. For transformative design work on a very important topic for one of the world's most important companies at one of our most important clients, that could sound like that's a ton of risk for us to take as a company. But I would actually argue the biggest risk would have been not developing our future leaders. So Regina, who's in this room, an experienced consultant, and Matt, an innovation strategist, both blew my mind with how they thought about this problem. They truly brought art and science together to think about the issue in such a smart, scalable way. They had to figure it out amongst themselves, and they solved it in a way that no one could have ever guided them to. That's because they were empowered and understood that that opportunity is, is actually their own development tool, but really a development tool for the rest of us too. And finally, and I promise I'm wrapping up here, I'll share a proto principle that happens to also be my life mantra, which is yes is a, a success metric. So when I go to sleep every night, this is real, uh, I think about how many times I got to say yes versus how many times I got to say no. The days I got to say yes more than no are always my best days. It sounds simple, but honestly, it's trickier than it sounds. And you can understand why, because of all the ambiguity we talked about before. It's very easy to say no when you're being presented with a new way to think about something or a new approach to a problem you've solved successfully in a previous context. But the reality is we can't say we value new practices over best practices or that we give people the freedom to fail unless we actually give them a chance to ask and say yes. So what's more empowering than telling someone yes when they ask for something? This is especially difficult for new leaders, which is why I wanted to mention it here. Because what's interesting is, you'll, I watch people, they will be a pioneer, get a yes, do it, and then immediately start saying no once they've been promoted or put in charge. And I can understand why, that's human nature. Because you go, well, the system's clearly working if it's working for me. So then you think, I better protect that system. But actually, if you're given that yes in the first place, the most powerful thing you can do, and the way I measure success, is to pass that yes on forward. And actually, when we do our manager reviews at Proto, as a result, one of the things we focus on explicitly is how often you say yes to your people. So when Jamie, an engagement director, who led a big transformation project for a ma major retailer, this is actually her first project at Proto, or maybe second, she immediately told us, when she completed it, she immediately told us all the things we could do <laughs> better. Uh, as I said, we're, we're fond of that gift of feedback. We said yes to almost all of them. Then, when we tasked her with helping put together our approach for a new project, a big transformation project for a private equity-owned uh, company, we tried implementing a bunch of them. And guess what? Most of them worked. This is a person who, regardless of their tenure, had the energy and the compassion to actually fix things that we didn't have right when she got there. And all it took was for us to be able to say, yeah, Jamie, let's try it your way, because clearly you told us our way didn't work for you. And that helps us all get better at what we do. And that's what all these philosophies are about. Obviously, there's some that I, weren't able, I wasn't able to get to. But it's ultimately about empowering people to be as great as they can be, both in depth and in breadth. That means not asking them to follow complicated processes or rules, but instead, first, empowering them to work together to decide their own best way forward, because they're adults and they're pioneers. They're here to invent our collective future together, so leading with empathy is beneficial to all parties involved. And when you aren't sure, because no one knows every right answer, no matter how many founders you throw at a problem, just say yes, like Rashad did for me all those years ago. Thanks for giving me a chance to tell you a little bit about empowering multidisciplinary talent, talk a little bit about empathetic leaders. I'm hoping you found some of the principles useful. Um, you can look them up yourself uh, on our Instagram page, and I welcome you to steal them, improve them, all feedback on them are welcome. And I'll close with some perspective, which is having been at this, at times, crooked journey traversing cities and disciplines over the last 20 years, a number I wasn't going to say out loud before, Tangi. Thank you. <laughs> I can honestly say that I feel the same way 
And that the same way I did when I was a MAPE intern walking into now this building, which is where Proto is headquartered at Three World Trade here in New York, and it's because of the people that greet me when I walk in. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I'm happy to do Q&A. I'm sorry. If anyone had any questions for Sunil, um, we can take a few questions. Should I call on people randomly? They love that. Yeah, do that. They love that. Uh, I think you were first, and then you can go next. Blue shirt, yeah. Yes, uh, hi. Hey, what's your name? Hi, my name is Abel Hackett, um, and I just wanted to ask. Uh, when you're starting uh, as like in, in like a, I guess, starting role, um, how do you make sure that your, your manager is kind of empowering you to, to when they say that they want to empower you for leadership growth, um, how do you make sure that you're, you're getting multidisciplinary like um, experience and then also making sure that you're not messing up anything with the clients, but you're also getting that experience to maybe move to a different role or, or keep keep growing your, your I guess, T-shaped talent like you, you yeah, talked about? Yeah, uh, great question. I will say the answer is surprisingly simple, which is saying explicitly what you need for help. And I appreciated that actually that was the theme of the talk right before, which is just asking for help. But even if you say, I'd like to be empowered, I will tell you as a manager, I've managed a lot of people now. And there are people who really struggle when I first start managing them because what I think of as empowerment, some people think is just like leaving them alone. And they're like, where are you? Be more present. Why aren't you asking me things? So I was like, oh, I, the way I like to be managed was give me some space. But you come to realize, like, look, that's a personal decision, which is like, tell, tell us as managers, and I hope when you're a manager, someone will tell you, this is what I would find empowering. And it's amazing, even if you don't know the exact tactic, but to say, this is the type of person I am, and this is what works well for me. So one thing that we do at our company is we make everyone make a read me when they start, just like, you know, like a read me, this might be pre a tech phrase from before your time. Uh, so you know, you open some new software, and if you're a developer, you'd like to read what the person there has done before, uh, or you're about to use a new tool. And it's just, what would you want someone to know before they dive in? Think about that for yourself. And so we make that a really short document that says, look, I tend to work well. I'm quiet, and I process things. So even if I'm not responding, please understand I'm engaged. That's really helpful to read before I have a meeting with you. So systems like that, we've just kind of made systematic. But honestly, you don't have to wait till someone asks you. Just tell them, this is how I like to operate. Hey, I tend to be slower in the afternoons and the mornings. Great, that helps me understand what, when to book a meeting with you even. So I would just ask as explicitly as you could. I think you had a question. Hey, Sunil, really hey. enjoyed the presentation. Thanks. Um, my name is Josh German. Um, I was wondering, what was the hardest thing changing between the disciplinaries of strategy throughout your career, like going from different disciplines to the next one? And then what was the easiest? The hardest thing in terms of change, uh, wow, that's a great question. Um, you know, when you are sitting in one seat, you and this is actually what makes me a frustrating employee at times, is I'm strongly opinionated. Uh, and so I go, look, I, can, I know exactly what should be happening in this other chair. And then you sit in it, and it's a good reminder about what empathy really is, which is to go, actually, I can kind of see how I thought that when I was a strategist, but now that I'm a creative, I kind of see why that's actually annoying and not helping me. And then you end up kind of feeling a little bit embarrassed about some of the stuff you did in your previous role. Uh, so that's, it's, it's hard to think that no matter how empathetic you're trying to be, it's very hard to actually put yourself in someone else's shoes uh, until you actually do it and, and live it. Um, and the easiest one, honestly, is what I talked about. I just had leaders that let me do it. And that's my goal, to try to pay forward to people. Yeah. Um, was there one more question? R Rima, or yeah? Hey, friend. Hey. Um, <clears throat> success is like not the absence of anxiety, fear, depression. No, the opposite. Imposter syndrome. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, especially when you were talking about like ambiguity and being comfortable with it, and I'm like, that scares the shit out of me, right? So how, especially like when you're not always comfortable being that voice in the room, right? Whether you might look different from other people or you just don't have that confidence. Like what are some tips when you or anyone you've managed um, goes through that, right? Those fears that like freeze you and pause you and like make you scared to take that next step um, or actually just like fuels your anxiety and your imposter syndrome. Um, yeah. You know, what, what do you do when you're there, right? Because there's a lot of amazing ideas, but sometimes you're just, you get stuck in your own brain. Yeah. And it can, 
end up messing you up. So any, any t thoughts on that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So, um, so it's interesting because, again, I, the, way that, the way everyone deals with that, I, I suffer from anxiety disorder, as you know, but, uh, what, you know, and I talk about it openly. And I think there's a belief that how you, that the way you manifest stress is the way other people will manifest it. So people have a way of only looking for their own tells, when in reality you go, look, that person is kind of shutting down, or that person is like way over opinionated or bringing too much to the table at this point. And I think if you have, if you can find enough EQ about the people around you to go, hey, that person is, is clearly finding something extra stressful at the moment or might be suffering from a little bit of the ambiguity, that, uh, that is just one thing I encourage everyone to do. It's, it's actually the reason we did the readmes in the first place was to just get a sense of, of how to do it. But in terms of like how you figure out the right way to voice it, um, I've always found that um, the worst mistake, and this is not advice, this is the opposite of advice, which is the worst mistake is to never voice it at all. Because I will tell you to other people, especially if you're, if you're introverted, and the majority of our company is, that it just bubbles up. And then suddenly when it does finally come out, people are like, whoa, what just happened? And when you go, well, I've been on a long journey. You have, I feel like every day felt like a month to me. And you're going, it's only been a week since we talked, and that seems shocking to me. That's the type of disconnect that's very easy to blame the person that you surprised for not registering. But I would actually say, like, I think most people need to put that onus on their self of, like, let me just voice. I'm struggling in ambiguity right now. I'm having a tough time. I need a minute. Do you mind if we come back to this? Like, just saying those things, I don't... I think in the year 2022, you'd be very hard pressed to find someone who isn't human enough to go, yeah, I, I can understand that, I can relate to that. So I just ask you to voice it. I know it feels vulnerable, but I'd actually argue it's empowering. Yeah. Uh, I think you were next, yeah. And then there's one back there too. Hey, Sunil, uh, I'm Caleb. Um, first off, thank you. This is incredibly entertaining, informative, and transparent. So Thanks. thank you for that. Um, being like young and where we're at in our careers, we're often told to, you know, make mistakes and, you know, do radical things and sometimes bite off more than you can chew, which um, is, of course, uh, easier spoken than done. Yeah. But I want to hear you share about a time where you made a mistake in your early, early, like first few years of your career and let's say the biggest one, but what you learned from it and how that helped you improve. Yeah, that's a great question. To be honest, I've made a lot more mistakes later in my career than early in my career. And I think that's dumb luck or maybe I'm getting more at bats. I'm not sure. Um, probably like one of the biggest mistakes that I, so I don't know if this is, if this is a good answer or if it's boring. Uh, I always worry about that whenever I answer one. But, um, so I, I actually started a company called, um, Finch 15, which is like a incubator for hire. Um, actually with Rashad, I don't know now, maybe 15 years ago or something. And prior to that, the way I'd always been told the entrepreneur story is, you're either going to be wildly successful or you're going to be or you're going to be a wild failure. Like that always seems like the outcome. Like you never read an article or now that this is a whole fucking genre of Netflix television of just like, you know, flame out disastrous founder stories. You just kind of go, "Okay, well, look, I'm either going to be, you know, flying in my chopper or uh, homeless or, or in jail or whatever the options are. I'm not sure anymore." And and actually what's interesting is you realize that there's a lot that's actually not a lot. The vast, vast, vast majority of outcomes are something in the middle. And so if you're looking at media or someone else's story to guide what you think your own metrics are for like, oh, this is what success is or this is what failure is, it's like, no, actually like a lot of outcomes are just kind of something in the middle and you have to know for yourself what that looks like is a thing I really regret not knowing when I started Finch 15 because I ended up with this thing in the middle. Like it was a fine company and it was like, kind of, I wasn't sure if it was successful or not. And, and I remember like having that as a thought and I was talking to Emma uh, as a mentor of mine about it. And she said, you're telling me that you want me to define what success looks like for you. And I remember the second she said it to me, I just like left that as like, yeah, what a stupid question. Like, I can't believe I brought to her, Hey, am I being successful in this thing? You don't know anything about anymore. It's like, that's kind of absurd, but I had to say it out loud. So anyway, for me, that mistake was just not going in having some sense of an expectation of what I'm looking for and just taking that beat because I move too fast. And I've learned a little bit about not moving so fast as a result. That's one of many times I've learned that lesson painfully. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. I, was there a follow-on question in there that I lost? Okay. All right. <laughs> no, no, no. Thanks. Uh, I think there's one more question back here. Yeah. How's it going, Sunil? Um, thanks for this. This was incredible. Oh, thanks. Um, so as a new manager, one of the things that I'm finding is that 
it's almost easier to give people the answer, which means a lot more work for me than it is to help coach them how to get to like the solution. Mm -hmm. How do you balance, um, especially with, with team members who are, I don't want to say continuously kind of struggling during those challenges and something you specifically said was like uh, opportunity is a development tool. Yep. So as you're giving people these opportunities to develop and they're not developing in the way that they should be, or even maybe it's just the way that I want them to. Uh, but how do you balance like the coaching versus just like, you know what, I'll do it myself and just you execute? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I also want to clarify, I'm really bad at it. So I'm a bad person to answer this question. Um, and as, as the, you know, the people on my team would here would, would tell you, which is, I think when I'm short on time, I tell you the answer, which sucks. It's a horrible trait. I regret it after I do it. I, it'll be that night when it occurs to him, like, you know, in that one meeting, I basically just told them, just do this because I don't have time for the rest of it. And by definition, uh, the reason that's wrong is not because I didn't give that person opportunity. That compounds the problem. But actually, the, the underlying problem to that, in my opinion, is that I thought there was an answer. You see, like what the ego it takes for me to think I know the answer to this thing that hasn't existed before is like that's that's an ego issue, not a uh, an empowerment issue. By, so until I solve that, I haven't empowered that person because I haven't accepted that. Maybe the answer, unless we're doing math, maybe the answer isn't the thing that I predetermined. Um, and honestly, like the thing I have to remember is someone building something, and I would like to think as a manager, you think about it too because your people are the biggest reflection of what it is that you do at a company, in my or at a good company at least is if those people are a reflection of you and you want them all just to be clones of you, then you're never gonna get good people. You would never work for someone where you go, I wanna be exactly like that person and not my own version of it. So the best people wanna be the best version of themselves. So really, you kind of, I mean, to me, the easiest advice, to, the easiest way to think about it, but the hardest advice to follow is, how do you go, I actually don't know the answer, I know my version of that answer, and maybe there's a chance this person with less experience than me has better answers than I do. And maybe they can even give me some of the measuring sticks to actually figure out if they're better answers or not, because sometimes your own bias can keep you from that. So it's kind of more of a thing to remind yourself than it is like a tactical piece of advice, but it's hard to answer unless I know you're exact. Are you, do you do math for a living? Okay, well then probably that applies. <laughs> Great, thank you guys, I appreciate the time. Thanks.